Hi everyone, welcome back. In today's video I'm carrying on with my reviews of the Chronicles of Narnia series. We're now on the third book, The Horse and His Boy. I'm looking forward to talking about this one because when I was younger when I read the series, this was always the book that stuck out to me and I wasn't that much of a fan of it. But on reread I'm actually finding that it's a lot better than some of the other books that I preferred back then. Part 1. Summary. The Horse and His Boy tells the story of Shasta, the adopted son of a fisherman in the desert island of Calorman. Shasta's adventure begins when he overhears that his adopted father, Arshish, plans to sell him to a powerful Calomene nobleman. While Shasta awaits his new master in the stables, the nobleman's stallion, named Bree, begins to speak to Shasta. Bree tells Shasta his story. He was a talking horse from Narnia, who was captured by Calomenes as a foal. Together, the two of them decide to flee from Arshish and the nobleman, and escape Kalorman to Narnia. Along the way, they come across two other runaways, Aravis, a young Kalormen aristocrat, and her mare, Quinn, another talking horse. Together, the four of them travel to Narnia, uncovering a terrible Kalormen plot to cause discord in Narnia along the way. Part 2. A Unique Chronicle of Narnia So as I hinted at in the introduction, the Horse and His Boy is a very distinctive book in the Chronicles of Narnia series. The main reason for this is that most of the book takes place in Calomene, which is a place outside of Narnia and that has a very distinctive feel that's very different from that of Narnia. One big difference, of course, is Calomene itself. This is a place, a, a desert landscape, so a different setting in terms of uh, look from Narnia, which is medieval. Also in terms of the culture of Calomene, it is very different from that of Narnia. Narnia is a place of freedom and peace, at least at the time of this book, whereas Calamine is a place of unrest, there's corrupt lords, there's some pretty brutish, brutal practices going on. So very big difference in terms of the location with this one. Another thing that makes this book stand out from the other books is that the protagonists, so that's Bree, Shester, Avarice and Quinn, they only appear in this book. They don't return in later books or anything like that. So The Horse and His Boy is, of all of the Narnia books, just a self-contained story happening on its own. Chronologically though, it does take place in between the events of Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and Prince Caspian, because Susan, Lucy, Edmund and Peter are actually kings and queens in Narnia at the time that this story takes place. That the story sticks out in this way could be viewed as a negative thing or a positive thing, and I think when I was younger it was always a negative thing. It just seemed like an oddball in the series because it didn't play any part in the central storyline, and so I didn't really appreciate it for what it was. And this is something that I see in negative reviews of the book. In fact, oftentimes when I've read ranking things with the Narnia books, The Horse and His Boy will come last or close to last because people just don't understand its relevance in terms of the, the overarching story. That being said, if you can ignore this, I think that there are some great things in this book, and its uniqueness makes it so distinctive that it actually might be one of the best books in the series. The next book I'll be reviewing in the series will be Prince Caspian, and I will foreshadow what one of my complaints is going to be in that review. It's that the story, the central story, is very derivative and repetitive of previous storylines in the series, in particular The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. This one is completely unique, it's completely its own. It's really nice to see Lewis doing something different with this one. He's expanding his world in some cool ways, showing us an entirely different location with different culture, different people. He's giving us an adventure story where we get to see more places as the characters travel to Narnia. And also we've got new characters as well that we haven't seen before, and he also does these characters pretty well. I think Shasta especially is a great character, and so is Bree with his issues around being a talking horse that was brought up in a world where horses don't talk, and he's worried that when he goes back to Narnia the horses won't welcome him into the fold because he's different and maybe he won't act in the way that horses of Narnia act. So there are loads of cool things going on in this book that you just don't get in other volumes in the series, and I think it's a really good thing about this book. A final thing why I think this might be a good book, especially if you are one of the people who doesn't really like the Christian analogies with the Narnia series, this is probably the least heavy-handed book in terms of allegory. It really does feel very much like a self-contained story, and while there are somewhat, you know, there are still themes of forgiveness and those kinds of things, they're really in the background, or at least I thought they were really in the background. It seemed to me very much that this was just a off-the-wall adventure story that he just wanted to do to explore his world and do something different from the main um, arc of the story and purpose of the series overall. So if that is something that bothers you then I would recommend reading this one because I think it's a good example of a, an Arnia book that doesn't have the allegory stuff and is also a great story as well. 
Part 3. Balancing the Light and the Dark I would say that some of the themes in The Horse and His Boy are pretty dark in comparison to the rest of the series. Although Lewis's books have actually been complained, or at least at the time, people probably don't see them as that dark nowadays, but at the time people did complain about the violence and things in the books, even in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I mean, you have the White Witch, you know, nailing Aslan to the table. But I do think this one was especially dark, or had some dark moments. Both our main characters, Shasta and Avarice, are fleeing uh, incredibly scary circumstances. It's made very clear at the beginning of Shasta's story that he is abused by his adoptive father, who's going to sell him into slavery because it's more convenient for him to do so, and Avarice is about to be sold off to a 60-year-old man, even though she's, I think, 12 in the book. So there are pretty, some pretty brutal things going on, and they're not, you know, they're not made out to be much they're not well done very much, but like as a as an adult reader noticing those things, it's like wow, that's pretty heavy stuff. Although at the same time, there are some fun light moments as well. I really enjoy the bit where Avarice finds herself in a noble family, one of her friends who is part of this noble family, and they are very different. This girl that's her friend, um, she enjoys the noble life. She thinks that Avarice is a bit silly for wanting to run away, but she also helps her, and they end up getting in a couple of scrapes together, and I just think their chemistry with each other is really funny. Likewise, the relationship between Shasta and Avarice is nice and fun. They have a lot of tension with each other, playful tension. They're often squabbling, but they fundamentally get on with each other. So while there is some dark stuff, <laughs> the marrying of children and the domestic violence, there are also some light moments as well, so it's not all doom and gloom. This balancing lightness and darkness is also exemplified pretty well with Rabidash, the main villain. Rabidash is a pretty nasty person who thinks some pretty demeaning things, especially towards women, and he comes across as very threatening, at least when you first see him for a while, but ultimately his character unravels into basically a buffoon. In fact, he reminds me a lot of Uncle Andrew from The Magician's Nephew, in that his initial setup portrays him as being someone who's, you know, terrible and does cruel things, and then they find themselves in a situation where there's a more formidable opponent, and suddenly they just come across as incredibly absurd. And I, I think Lewis is actually better at writing these kinds of villains than he is writing straight-up evil villains, because his straight-up evil, evil villains, like the White Witch, or King Meraz, uh, who I really don't like as a villain, they tend to just be very, you know, just bad, nothing else. Whereas Rabidash just comes across as kind of naive and a bit stupid, so his badness is more complex than just evil for the sake of it. So I do actually think that Rabidash is a great villain, because he has that balance between being threatening on the one hand, but then just being kind of silly on the other. Part 4. Wider World Building I would say that either in this book or Voyage of the Dawn Trader is where the world building of Lewis's world building is at its best. It very much seemed that what Lewis wanted to do with this book was to tell a story about the wider world that he'd created, and just add a bit of richness and depth to his world. I also wonder if he was particularly inspired by Tolkien in this aspect, because he actually names one of his characters, Bree the Horse, after Bree the Town from the Lord of the Rings books, which is kind of a nice nod, and also I wonder if it was deliberate, because what Lewis wanted to do was kind of take after what Tolkien does, which is create incredibly broad, incredibly complex worlds, and he wanted to do something more in that vein, as opposed to something more simple and smaller, which is what we get in his other books. Of course, I'm not saying that the world of Narnia compares in terms of Middle-earth for vastness and complexity, because it certainly doesn't. Um, Lord of the Rings is very much an adult fantasy with a lot of detail to it, and Narnia is very much a children's YA world, and therefore it is quite simplistic in the way it's described, in the, you know, the subtlety in its cultures and places and these things. That being said, it, it does add an amount of richness and amount of depth, which is worth appreciating, even if it's not on the level of what you might expect in an adult fantasy book. Cal Orman, as I've said, feels very distinctive from Narnia in terms of its practices, its culture, and its people. And one thing that I especially like about Cal Orman and Narnia is that Lewis doesn't just make Cal Ormans out to be evil people through and through. In fact, the book is very much about tensions between different cultures and places, and we see sympathetic characters as well as villains from Cal Orman. We see this with Avarice, who is a noble from Cal Orman, and she is wanting to leave because of the way that she is being treated in that world. So you do get sympathetic characters on both sides, and that just adds a nice bit of complexity, because I think it would have been very easy with this book to have just been like, oh, Calamon's evil, and uh, 
Narnian's good. And while, yes, I think it certainly is the case that Narnia is meant to be a better place, it's not the case that Calamon is just evil through and through, it's just that it's a different place with different cultures and customs. Even Shasta's dad, who abuses him, or adopted dad I should say, um, he, yes he abuses him and sells him into slavery, but there is something in the book that kind of suggests that the reason why he does this is because he's in an extreme case of poverty. And I like that again because it just adds a little bit of nuance to these characters, and even if they're still bad people or doing bad things, you get an understanding for why they do the things that they do, and I appreciate that. I also want to say something a little bit more about Rabidash here, but that does involve spoilers, so if that bothers you, you might want to jump to the conclusion of the video, skip ahead for like a minute or so. So Rabidash at the end of the story is turned into a donkey by Aslan and sent back to Kalaman, and he has to show himself at a temple in front of everyone, um, and he'll turn back, but obviously everyone will have known that he's turned, been turned into a donkey. Now, the reason why I think this happens as opposed to Rabidash being killed, like many of the villains in previous books have, is because Lewis does want, doesn't really want Rabidash to be seen as a complete villain. He's just someone who has made some mistakes and can be forgiven for those mistakes, at least to some extent. And I think this suggests again that ultimately it's not a tale of this place good, this place bad. It's a tale of this place has some problems, but the people can still change and grow and develop into better people. Which is why we see Rabidash at the end of the book being humiliated, but still being given a chance to improve and to grow and learn from his mistakes. Part 5, Conclusion. So The Horse and His Boy really is a highlight in the Narnia series. It has a unique story and setting, and also has some great character work and world building. It's also a little less heavy on the Christian allegory stuff, so I think it's a really good option to read this one if you don't like that stuff, or you want to try something different within the series. I think this is a really good one to read, at least if you've read The Land of Witch in the Wardrobe. You should probably read that first, just because uh, some of the events do appear in this, albeit briefly. So I think it would be good to read that book and then read this one, just so that the references there make a little bit more sense. But yeah, I do think actually it might be a very good book to read if you are bothered by that Christian stuff in the series. I actually don't have any complaints this time with reading this one, other than to say that, it's not really my complaint, but some people do complain about the fact that it is so different from the other books in the series and doesn't really fit in the main narrative. But given the other things, given the cool character work, the world building and all of that, I don't think it matters that much, although if you like things to have a, you know, books in a series to have a more concrete narrative flow, it may be something that you don't like when it comes to this one. But for me, I really changed my mind on this one, and I think that it is actually one of the better books in the series. Okay, that's it for today's video. Please let me know down below what you think of The Horse and His Boy, whether you think it is a kind of an oddball in the series and why is it there, or whether you think actually it might be one of the better ones in the series. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like, and subscribe to my channel for more content. I post new videos once a week on Mondays at 4pm. That's it for me now though, so take care everyone, and I'll see you all next time. Next time!